Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, exchange of ideas, and the arts. Today's session uh, is part of a four-part series, which we, with affection and lovingly, like to call the Raja Nawab series, uh, uh, with a nod to uh, Professor uh, Kenneth, Dr. Kenneth Robbins, who has brought this series to us. Today's session is African Rulers and Generals in India, Afro-South Asia in the Global African Diaspora. Africans and their descendants have long migrated across the Indian Ocean as sailors, merchants, soldiers, scholars, musicians, and explorers. Some of these Africans and their descendants rose to great positions of power and received much acclaim, becoming rulers, generals, viziers, and regent ministers, as well as artists, clerics, and even saints. The lives of figures such as Malik Ambar, Begum Hazrat Mahal, and General Hoshu Muhammad Shidi are among the many who illuminate Afro-South Asia as an integral part of the global African diaspora. This session will have two presentations. The first one by Omar Ali is titled Africans in the Ruling, El in the ruling Elites of Bijapur and Ahmednagar, which delves into the history of Africans in these two Deccani Sultanates, where they held a powerful political and military presence. The second presentation is by Kenneth X. Robbins and Pushkar Sohoni titled Z Janjira and Sachin. African ruled states in India. Uh, this review covers the impregnable island fort, powerful naval forces, beautiful palaces, early an early Muslim feminist novel, and even a movie star. The full bios of all the speakers will appear in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, towards the end of the session, if you have any questions, please feel free to use uh, the Q&A box, which is also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and uh, with that, I hand it over to Pushkar and Mr. Robbins. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Leika. Uh, can we put up the first uh, PowerPoint? I'll do it. Yeah. Um, this is a long range project that, uh, yes, that I've been working on. And um, Many people are surprised that there are small African communities all over South Asia, uh, from Karachi to Bengal. And uh, so, of course, this needed a book, and we'll be talking about this later in the series. Um, and approximately three dozen scholars from all over the world participated in this. The reason we did three volumes was because we didn't want to limit ourselves to talking about poor African people, the poor Africans in the diaspora. We wanted to show the agency of Africans. And so we had a volume on people who work for political, spiritual, and musical liberation, ranging from Pan-Africanists to the mentors of Martin Luther King who met with Gandhi. And we also concentrated a lot on the musical thing, especially jazz. But the thing that has been closest to my heart has been the study of African elites in India. It may surprise many people to learn that there were places in Africa, in India, that were moved by Africans, ranging from the Hapshi dynasty of Bengal in the 15th century to the princely states of Janjira and Sachin and the tremendous role which Africans like Malik Ambar played in the Sultanates the De of the Deccan, such as Bijapur, Ahmednagar, and um, as well as the Bamani dynasty. So this project started with the first book, which would dealt with African elites in India, and we dealt with these various rulers and ruling elites. It then morphed into a, uh, an exhibit, which was done by the Schoenberg Center for uh, African Culture, 
as part of the New York Public Library. And this journeyed all over the world. Uh, the Indian government sent it all over India. It was at UNESCO and the United Nations. But this brings us to the book that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, as Laker told you, Africans and their descendants have come across as sailors, merchants, scholars, musicians, explorers, and rose to great positions of power. And so this is the thing that we're going to talk about. In the book itself, here are the chapters that we discussed. The intellectual and artistic contributions of Africans. For example, there was a Mughal artist who painted uh, for, for Akbar in the late 16th century. There were a number of African, uh, East African savants who were Muslim scholars in India, and we can see them in a number of different settings. The most surprising was that uh, people like Wajid Ali Shah in Lucknow and many Africans in their court, including Wajid Ali Shah had three African wives, one of whom was Husband Mahal, the famous Husband Mahal, the heroine of 1857, 1858, and her father was an African. And then there were quite a number of Africans who were served as prime ministers and de facto rulers of Bijapur, Nabin Nagar, such as Malik Ambar. Then we found that there were Africans in the armies of everybody from Kutch to Warnpathi to Hyderabad and so on. Most interesting was that the great defender of uh, Sindh against the British in the 19th century was a uh, general Hashu Mohammed Shidi, who uh, gave his life defending Sindh. And uh, we even found an African who came to India and then went on to become a samurai. So now we're gonna move on to talk about Omar, Omar uh, Ali's presentation. Omar, is a great scholar on the Indian Ocean, on the African diaspora. He's written a number of very interesting books, including one about Malik Ambar. Uh, he couldn't join us today because he's in Florence, but he's left us with a, with a video. He is the Dean of the Arnott's College at University of North Carolina, Greensboro. And uh, Leica, if you could put up his... Thank you very much, Ken, uh, for the introduction. I am very pleased to be uh, participating, albeit uh, via video, um, uh, uh, in, this, in this discussion. And I'll be discussing uh, the African diaspora and the military uh, in Bijapur and Ahmednagar in the Deccan. So let me uh, share my screen and, uh, and we'll get started. Okay. So hopefully you can see my screen here. And uh, what I'd like to do is put it on uh, full. You can see this. Right. Okay. So when we talk about the African diaspora and the military presence in Bijapur and Ahmednagar, uh, we begin by, I think, um, thinking about the overall African diaspora and military role in the Indian Ocean world during the early modern period. I've written, uh, several books uh, prior to this three volume one, specifically uh, the biography on Malik Ambar and Islam in the Indian Ocean World. But the three volumes that uh, we're celebrating here is really uh, bringing together, you know, you know, almost three dozen scholars from many different fields who are talking about uh, the, the African presence across the Indian Ocean and the impact uh, globally on Africans and relations with other groups of peoples. And of course, Africans are very different kinds of people across even just East Africa. Uh, but what, what I wanna focus on is this is specific area. And so Malik Ambar is a very important figure in this history and trying to understand uh, the trajectory of the military uh, and African diasporic presence uh, in this part of the world, uh, specifically in the Deccan in Bijapur and Ahmednagar. So, when just panning out, what we see is a, a view of the world and uh, where we are is basically in South Asia, 
on the western side in this area called the Deccan. Uh, and uh, there was this sort of uh, five major kingdoms that came out of uh, a series of, of fights and battles and wars, uh, and they were Muslim ruled. And uh, they were in some ways uh, at times friendly with each other, at other times enemies, but they all had to contend with the Mughal powers to their north. And so how is it that these Africans and these military presence of Africans uh, come about? Well, part of it is that they came across through the monsoons, uh, the ocean and wind currents that brought them from East Africa through trade, uh, through the, the, the slave trade, um, uh, but also as merchants and as, of course, as mercenaries and uh, enslaved soldiers uh, who served various uh, courts. And they are part of a very large network of people's products and ideas going across this world uh, over the span of at least a thousand years prior to this period of time that we're talking about here is the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, we have documentary evidence that goes back uh, to at least the first century common era um, about uh, sources that look at the trade uh, ports and, 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 uh, and cities that were trading goods everywhere from uh, Ethiopia to Gujarat. Um, so people traveled um, by ship. Uh, there were, of course, caravan routes uh, overland, but of course that was a much longer way to get there. So the vast majority of people made their way via ships. And there is a long tradition of an African presence uh, that goes back to the ancient world of, of people uh, populating this area. But most of what we're talking about is from the early modern period. Uh, some of the people who preceded the military soldiers uh, of African descent in South Asia included people from the area of Southern Iraq uh, in famously the Zanj Rebellion. So there is a black military presence across this region for some time. Uh, we know of some of the accounts from a great, uh, um, uh, great chronicler, uh, Ibn Battuta from Morocco, who travels across this world, sort of the Marco Polo of the Islamic and Indian Ocean world, who gives eyewitness accounts of these Abyssinians, which is the older word used for Ethiopians across this world as sailors and as, and as, um, as merchants and as soldiers. But it's important to note that not all enslaved people in the Indian Ocean world were African. And not all Africans were enslaved in this world. Many Africans, as I mentioned, were sailors, merchants, and soldiers who traveled across the Indian Ocean on their own accord. So Islam is part of this network of people, products, and ideas, having spread from the seventh century now for a thousand years by the 17th century uh, across this world and is connected to the, uh, the Middle East and the Northern Africa and all the way out to Iberia, down the East African coast. And there will be a presence of Islam, not so much an African presence in Southeast Asia as well. Uh, we have figures, uh, Bilal ibn Rabah, a very important companion of the Prophet Muhammad. And uh, he actually does serve in military capacity. He's known as the Muazin, the person who makes the call to prayer, but is also somebody who wages war in the campaigns of Islamic expansion in the, uh, in the seventh century. A number of names are used for people of African descent in South Asia, Kafir, Sidi, and Habshi. And there's a lot to say about each of them, but the word, um, the word Kafir is actually a, a derogatory term used in East Africa or Southeast Africa, but it's been appropriated by people in Sri Lanka of African descent. And there's different origins of these different words, but different names used in the records. Um, I mentioned soldiers and slaves, but people were working in a whole host of, of, of labor forms. Um, so as domestic servants with regards to women, but also as administrators. And we'll see that with um, Malik Ambat. So people were taken from across East Africa to the Middle East uh, and to South Asia. Uh, over the course of uh, over a thousand years, um, we have most of the evidence from the modern, early modern period. And they were traded, and they were also traders, and that's important to note. And so people came out of this Islamic world uh, across Arabia, as in the case of Malik Gambar, and made their way to South Asia. So this is a, a portrait of Malik Gambar at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Uh, it's, a, it's a miniature, as is the style of many paintings at the time. Uh, depicting him. This is another person. Now, this is uh, 
um, Ilkhas Khan. Now, Malik Ambar, who I showed in the earlier picture here, is from the kingdom of Ahmedinejad, although he was in Bijapur for a time under the ruler, the regent ministry of, of uh, Chand Bibi. But the, this person here is his contemporary named Ilkhas Khan, and I love showing this image because it shows him in all his glory with a petition, his hand on a sword showing his power, and somebody who's phenotypically lighter skinned, as it turns out, serving him who's darker skinned, which is really a reversal of race relations as we've come to understand in the Atlantic world. Um, so powerful image here of Ilkhas Khan, who was a contemporary of Malik Ambar. I mentioned Chan Bibi. Chan Bibi was an important regent minister, a sultana, uh, who was both in Bijapur and would famously uh, defend the fort uh, at Menegar. And uh, Malik Ambar for a time served under her and also was perhaps inspired by her fierce independence against Mughal incursions into the area. And uh, this is a, a, a tomb of Malik Ambar, uh, which shows in some ways the, the, the kind of the majesty and the command and power that he had. So who was Malik Ambar? So let's go back to Malik Ambar. Malik Ambar was born Oromo in Ethiopia, and he makes his way uh, he's enslaved as, a, as in his teens sometime, taken up to Baghdad. He converts, into is, to converts to Islam, but doesn't just do so nominally, because we know in later years when he's taken from Baghdad to the Deccan and rises to power, uh, that he will uh, be known to go among his own soldiers and, and do some recitation of the, of the Quran. So he's somebody who, who uh, adopted Islam as his own. Um, and People adopted Islam for many reasons, because that's if you wanted to trade with fellow Muslims, that was probably a better way to negotiate if you were a fellow Muslim, uh, but not necessarily. But uh, uh, that was in some ways one of the prevailing ideas. But also Islam was a very important part of this world and people adopted it because they saw in some ways the virtues of Islam and being part of this larger Ummah, Wahida, this Muslim shared Muslim community. And he rises to power right at the turn of the 17th century and will become the de facto ruler of the kingdom of the Sultan, Sultanate of Ahmednagar, where he installs several uh, rulers during his, uh, his time there who all seem to mysteriously die around the age of 12 or so. So he's really the person in charge. And what he's mostly known for is having kept the Deccan independent from Mughal rule. The Mughals were an imperial power in the north and were trying to take over the Deccan. And for about a quarter of a century, he was able to, through diplomatic um, affairs and guerrilla warfare, as well as fortifying existing uh, fortifications. Um, and uh, his, his, uh, his sort of long-term strategy to keep alliances was able to keep the Deccan, the Deccan independent of the Mughals. When he passed away within just a couple of years, actually, the Mughals came in. And we also talked about Ilkhaz Khan, who was also a contemporary. And these two figures really are part of an Abyssinian nobility in this region. And it's a fascinating story of African rulers in India. And most of them in, become powerful through military. Uh, some of them, like Malik Ambar, came as slaves. Others came as mercenary soldiers. But there was a significant presence of African soldiers and increasingly noblemen uh, as part of these kingdoms of uh, Bijapur and Ahmednagar. So they are part of a network of other rulers and independence uh, uh, resistance uh, fighters like Chand Bibi, uh, who, uh, who becomes powerful in their own right. And there's a coalition, if you will, of people who are of Persian descent, uh, then Hindus who are known for their fierce cavalry um, and, uh, and the Abyssinians. And this was the world of the Deccan and the military uh, uh, presence of Africans as part of a larger grouping of people in this early modern period. So the descendants of these Africans are still there. This is a painting from the 19th century, but as I'll show you in the next uh, image, these communities are still alive and kicking and they are, um, they are, they are making their way in Indian society. Uh, and, and there are many of these communities across South Asia, to, in Pakistan, in, in the areas of Bangladesh, in, in India, and in Sri Lanka. So there we have it, uh, some of the descendants of some of these sailors, soldiers, merchants, military rulers. And with that, I just want to thank you and point
Uh, I initially worked with Sylvie M. Diouf on it in the Schomburg, and he did a fantastic exhibit uh, that he has been uh, exhibiting across the world uh, through UNESCO with, uh, with Sylvie M. Diouf on, on the African elites. Uh, but this one is part of an online exhibit that's still available called the African Diaspora in the Indian Ocean World, if you'd like to check that out and uh, use it for your classroom or for your own, um, uh, for your own uh, learning. So with that, thank you very much, Ken, as always, thank you for your leadership around getting this material out to broader audiences. And I'm so proud of our three volume uh, Africans and um, the Afro South Asians in the global African diaspora. And I will pass things on to the next presenter who I believe is coming up next. Thank you so much. Take care. Well, that was a great uh, encyclopedic study of and just touches on the surface of what we're talking about and next we have somebody i've worked with for a long period of time pushkar sahoni and pushkar and i um, did a book together on jews in the deccan and uh, mumbai and uh we're now working on a set of volumes about uh, Kolapur and the Deccan States Agency, and we'll be going to a number of these places. And of course, one of the uh, places uh, in that area was a state ruled by Africans called Janjira. So I'm going to let Pushkar take over now and show you his slides. Sure. Hello, good evening to everybody. And if you're in different time zones, of course, it's not just good evening, but uh... Let me get started by talking about uh, one of the many places that Ken will take you through later uh, after I'm done. But I'll be talking about a place called Janjira, which is not only a fort as people know it, but also an important uh, uh, princely state that survives till 1948. And Ken will tell you more about that. However, I am charged with talking to you about two things that survive well in this princely state, one of which is the fort of Janjira, and the other, which is a set of uh, royal uh, cenotaphs and tombs at a place not too far away, a place called Khokri. Now, the fort of Janjira is located on an island just off the west coast of India, about 85 uh, kilometers as the crow flies uh, south of Bombay. It serves as the stronghold of the Janjira state. And it was ruled by an ethnic group of administrator warriors of East African descent called the Siddhis, who started off as nobles in the court of Ahmadnagar. And the Siddhis eventually created an independent kingdom centered around this very island fort. They ruled for over 300 years from about 1621, where they declared themselves sovereigns, to 1948. And the word uh, Janjira itself comes from the Arabic word Jazira, which means island. Now, several features make this polity absolutely unique. It was one of the two princely states that were ruled by the Siddhis, and succession was decided by election, not by bloodline. Um, and it was also a state that was really based in the sea, and we'll see how. Uh, the fort of Janjira cannot be overstated as an you know, a, example of naval fortification. It was one of the few places, one of the few princely states which resisted all the major imperial powers of early modern South Asia, whether it's the Mughals, whether it's the English, the Portuguese, or the Marathas. The rulers of Janjira were called wazirs till 1803, after which they were all called Nawabs. And it's only after 1879 that they become dynastic. So let me. And this is another uh, uh, set of illustrations of this fort of Janjira. Again, it's been celebrated for being an absolute stronghold in the middle of the sea. Uh, it's unlike anything else you see uh, on the West Coast. The Siddhis, of course, also had uh, a princely state that was capable of uh, producing its own currency stamps and stamp paper. And the fort itself uh, 
doesn't just look impregnable, but it is because the entrance to it cannot be easily found. It cannot be easily seen when one approaches it. The main entrance to the fort is on the eastern side facing the mainland and it's accessible by steps from a small landing area. And the only other opening to the whole fort is a postern gate which faces north. The island is congruent with the fort and it encloses 22 acres. Malik Ambar actually set up the first Siddhis on this island and made them fort commanders. And it was after the fall of the uh, state of Ahmednagar that the Siddhis declared independence. Again, everybody who's encountered this fault has had some depiction of it, either visually or verbally, because it's one of those extraordinary sites. Uh, right down to the English, who are very desirous of possessing it for the longest time, but they too can never capture it. The fort has seen lots of accretions, additions, alterations, repairs, and additions over the past three, four hundred years, constantly upgrading the fortification. Uh, the fort faces a settlement called Rajapuri, which is on the mainland. And there was a small fortified settlement there as well. Uh, the Marathas tried to capture Janjira for the longest time. And in fact, early on, uh, they tried to build a fort called Padmadurga, not too far away on another rocky outcrop uh, as a way to capture the fort of Janjira. But the whole plan never quite succeeded. And this is the fort of Padmadurga which was later used as a garrison and barracks by the Siddhis themselves who took it over. Today, I'll talk about just two things, the Fort of Janjira, which you see on your left, and the tombs at Kokri, which you see on your right. The Palace of Ahmad Ganj, which is a 20th century palace built by the Nawabs of Janjira, is something Ken will tell you more about. Now, the fort of Janjira, like I said, is impossible to attack from the sea because the waters are very shallow. What you're actually doing is punting across in small boats over uh, a rocky uh, reef, and therefore no big ship can actually have an invasion of this fort. The entrance is quite well concealed. There is only one entrance, and it's very difficult to reach it using superior firepower. You can only land very small craft uh, because the waters are very shallow. And even today, that's the only way to enter the fort. And as you do, you're confronted with a number of uh, relief sculptures, which are common throughout the Deccan, that of a lion or a leonine figure trampling a number of elephants. You will also see this at Hampi. You'll see this in all the sultanates. It's a talisman for good luck. From the high sea, uh, there is no landing spot, so there is no question of having an invasion. Besides, on the open sea, you are covered by all kinds of fire and uh, you know uh, bastions and towers used for cannon. Uh, and small craft is the only way uh, to enter the fort. Again, the entrance, cleverly concealed, can be approached only through small craft. Uh, which again are covered by gunpowder. There are no big windows at the lower uh, levels of the fort and therefore there is no question of uh, entering the fort uh, from the sea. Again, in silhouette against the light, it's very difficult to make out the military features of the fort and therefore one cannot really see from a distance unless you already are informed of where the major defenses are. The entrance again is uh, accessible only at certain uh, tidal times. So you have to wait for the right tide to enter those steps, which are again, very slippery with moss and also have barnacles and other things that can cut feet. This is the postern gate on the northern side, the only other point of access to inside the fort. But like any good postern, uh, the uh, 
access to it is very narrow and very heavily guarded. Inside the fort, you have enormous amounts of areas, both for stockpiling ammunition, but also for to serve as barracks for the people who served on the inside. The fortification has all been repaired in the 18th century uh, under uh, Siddhi Surur Khan, who also starts building for himself a massive funerary structure on the mainland. It is in the late uh, 19th, I mean, sorry, uh, late 17th century uh, and the early 18th that the Siddhis are at their greatest as a political power and also in terms of the territory they hold. They hold not only this fort and a bit of the coast, but they hold as many as 20 forts inland. Uh, Siddhi Qasim, who succeeded uh, somebody called Sumbul Khan in 1676, also became the admiral of the Mughal fleet. The name Yakut Khan was a title used by many Siddhi commanders and conferred by the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb. And Siddhi Qasim is the important uh, Siddhi, also known as Yakut Khan, uh, who not only uh, becomes the naval commander of the Mughals, but consolidates the position of the Siddhis, Siddhis on the West Coast forever. In 1733, uh, the Siddhis sign a treaty with the English as well, uh, both for offensive and defensive alliances, and that allows for a period of relative peace. And it's in this period, in the 1730s, that a whole new set of fortifications is built on the island, but also on the mainland. Older cannon, which were lying at the site, uh, were, of course, you know, uh, positioned as if to, um, they're, they're positioned much later as if to suggest that they were used in fighting from the 18th century onwards. But a number of these cannon are actually much older. The site also has a number of Dutch, uh, English, and other European cannons. There was a very uh, dense settlement inside the fort. And in fact, people lived here till 1972, when the Archaeological Survey of India eventually evicts them. This is a palace built by Siddhi Surur Khan, uh, the same person who, under whom, whose reign uh, Janjira finds its biggest territorial expansion and also a period of relative wealth. There are two freshwater bodies inside which supply drinking water uh, to the fort. Again, one can see cannons strewn all over the fort pointing in various directions, uh, suggesting the kind of formidable stronghold that it was. Now, these two brothers, Siddhi Qasim, whom I mentioned earlier, and his brother Khairiyat Khan, both ruled Janjira in succession for a period of nearly 40 years. And they built for themselves modest tombs at a place called Khokri, which is not too far away from Janjira. This is on the mainland. If you notice the tree, it's a baobab tree, another symbol of an African connection, as uh, this is a tree that's endemic to Africa. It's brought over by a number of Siddhis to India from the 14th century onwards. And almost every place in India which has a baobab tree, uh, uh, I can guarantee has some kind of Siddhi connection, all the way from the Sultanates of Malwa, uh, Bengal, and so on. These two tombs uh, were modest, but modesty was not the hallmark of the person who succeeded uh, these two people. Uh, Siddhi Surur Khan, who built for them himself this magnificent palace on the island of Janjira, also built for himself an enormous tomb. This tomb really is unsurpassed in terms of its scale uh, in the land of Janjira. What you have are tombs like this in Bijapur. And it wouldn't be surprising if he got Bijapuri craftsmen to come and work for him, because Bijapur is clearly on the decline in the 18th century as Janjira find its ascendancy. Uh, there are a number of inscriptions on these tombs which allow us to date them uh, with some amount of accuracy. 
of course, in this whole funerary complex, you not only have tombs, but also a number of mosques and large graves. Now, what's very curious about these tombs is all these tombs are supposed to face uh, or be oriented in the direction of Mecca, so that when a person is buried underground and placed to rest on his right-hand side, he faces Mecca. But you also see a difference in orientation of the older tombs of Khairiyat Khan and Qasim Khan vis-a-vis uh, -vis the tomb of Siddhi Surur Khan, who comes slightly later. This might suggest uh, a period of greater prosperity where not only do you have better instruments to measure directions, but also have become part of the mainstream where you want to follow the correct prescriptive practices. There are, of course, in the area, other tombs which remain unprotected, uh, some of them on private lands. In any case, uh, the kind of magnificence of the fault of Janjira and this whole necropolis at uh, Kokri uh, leave a lot to wonder about. So if anybody ever travels uh, south of Bombay, close to Alibag, do not uh, forget to visit these two places. Uh, they are among the few buildings we have of a Siddhi dynasty uh, from the 18th century, building for themselves magnificent uh, palaces and tombs. The decoration, ornament, and motif borrows from all over the Deccan uh, uh, and also from the Mughals. So you will see things that are very Bijapuri, uh, sometimes very Mughal, and also sometimes shared with the Marathas. There are a number of graves at this site, again, in lamentable condition. Hopefully, they will be taken care of better. And the kind of motifs you find on the tombs here. So on the top left, you have something uh, from the tomb at Kokri. On the bottom left, you have something which is, uh, uh, you know, um, from uh, Mughal Palace in Agra. On the top right, you have a gun in Paranda, which has the same. And the bottom right, you have a temple built by the Marathas in the 1740s, where the same kind of decoration is being used. What this talks of is not only a sharing of various kinds of craftsmen and guilds, but also being integrated into a much larger cultural and social landscape, where everybody is uh, aspiring to the same kind of greatness, uh, hiring the same kinds of people and believing in the same larger shared world. And uh, again, I'll just leave you with this image. Uh, let me hand it over to Ken now. Uh, I'll be talking about Janjira and Sachin. And here are two of the Nawabs. On the left-hand side, you see the Nawab of uh, Janjira with Khan. And on the right-hand side, the Nawab of Sachin, Haider Khan, who this is his 1930 investiture uh, portrait. So let me talk first about Ahmed Khan. The situation was this. Yes, the CDs had Shanjira had become very powerful, but by the 19th century, their technology on ships was outmoded. Uh, the area fell into a disarray for several reasons, one of which is there was no uh, organized succession, no primogeniture, and the various uh, Africans fought over who was going to take power, and the state fell into difficult times. The British reacted to this by sending the young, a young prince off to Rajkumar College in Rajkot for him to be educated. And when his bride died, they married him to a 13-year-old girl from uh, a very prominent family. She was not an African. Uh, she was uh, a member of the Tayapshi family, and her particular family was called the Faizis. And it was uh, Nasli Faizi. So this was a family that uh, was very liberal, emancipated, 
Uh, the girls in the family went off to boarding schools in Europe and things like that. And she was advertised the only emancipated queen of the Muslim world. So this, she needed a very different setting. You saw the rough and ready place on Janjira Island. I'm told that I, for the accounts that I've read that um, the island of Alice had all sorts of spears and, uh, and swords and shields on the walls and animal trophies. And she wanted a different, more westernized sort of setting uh, where she could, uh, and so there is only one tiger, stuffed tiger in the whole palace that was built for her uh, by her husband. And that was probably put in later. So this is what it looks like. It's an absolutely magnificent early 20th century structure. And it's a magnificent private home as much as it is a palace. Uh, in the photo on the left-hand side, you can barely see behind the bench part of the Masnid where the Nawab sat when he greeted people. Uh, there's another one on the left-hand side. And the house has such beautiful decoration as the staircase is only one of the beautiful features. And there I am visiting with the present Nawab who lives there. It is an absolutely magnificent and cultured, civilized place. It's not open to the public, uh, but it is, it is magnificent. So in the book, we've tried to show you some of the great features of this thing. So what was the life of Ahmed Khan, the African or Hapshi Nawab of Janjira and his wife? His wife, Nasli, had a close friend, Sarojini Naidu, the poet of India. And she said that she would like to dwell in the seaborne kingdom and spoke about her as a fairy queen of a fairy clime where life glides soft to a delicate measure with the glamour and grace of a bygone time. She would dwell where the wild doves wander, lulled by the runs of the rhythmic waters and your island of bliss that is always spring. Well, Nasli didn't like the island. She liked more westernized and uh, uh, modern things. And here's a painting of her in her swan boat that was done by her brother-in-law, who was an indigenous Jew who had converted to Islam and took the Faisi family name when he married Nasli's sister. So maybe this also is a good opportunity to tell you that there were more indigenous Indian Jews in the kingdom than there were Africans. Now the Jews uh, pressed vegetable oil and left uh, again soldiers and sailors and uh, got involved in a number of other things. They were not in business. As I said, they were known for pressing vegetable oil. Uh, and uh, whereas the Africans were a small clique of elite figures. So this was an idyllic situation. And there is a picture of Nasli with her husband, Ahmed, and this great journey that they took to Europe in 1908. And she described how intelligent he was and how brilliant he was and how even though they were part of a small state that uh, King George V was taken by him and how brilliant he was and so on and so forth. And um, on the return, there was reception and she experienced what she called happiness beyond the realm of possibility. Love of one's homeland is better than Solomon's kingdom. A thorn from one's homeland is better than fragrant. And there she is in a, on the right-hand side in another picture, which was done by her brother-in-law, which is now in Pakistan. So how did it get to Pakistan? Well, you're going to have to wait for the, to read the book because what happened was 
that Ahmed Khan wanted a son and she had no children and he wanted to take a second wife who was an African, which he did. And the present Nawab is descended from that second wife. It's actually a third wife because his first wife had died. Uh, and they were totally estranged. And later, the state tried to claim that he had divorced her and there was a big trial and so on and so forth, all these documents. And she wrote this vitriolic letter to Queen Mary, which we quote from in the book, saying that he was a terrible person and that all men are terrible and men shouldn't be rulers and uh, that he was stupid and so on and so forth. But she had written a book why the marriage was well, going well, about how brilliant he was. Uh, and this vitriolic letter was turned into a feminist novel by her brother-in-law, the artist Faisi Rahmin. So this is a 1930s feminist novel based on the uh, vitriolic letter from a queen uh, and it's written by her brother-in-law. So it's a man writing a feminist novel. So this brings us to the second place, Janjira. Well, if you look at the map on the right-hand side, you see Janjira is clearly noted south of Bombay. But during the 17th century and the 18th century, the forces of Janjira moved north into the Gulf of Cambay. And among the following things occurred. One, they were a tremendous political force in Surat. This is because in the 1670s, the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb made one of the CDs the chief of the Mughal Navy. And they also took over another port, Jafirabad. And in the 1790s, one of the claimants to become the ruler of Sachin gave up his rights to the Marathas in return for a new state called Sachin. And so I want to tell you a little bit about this second state, Sachin. As you can see, the the uh, coats of arms of Janjir and Sachin are very, very similar. And they feature the warriors and ships. So this Janjir features the castle representing the island fort. And you see these very powerful uh, warriors. Janjir itself was a small state like many states, it had its own state ban, its small cavalry. Uh, it had stamp paper, it had fiscal stamps, which you can see the various designs of the Tugras and even medals as well. The family from the start was very cultured. In the early 19th century, one of the early Nawabs commissioned a tremendous manuscript which had just come on the market and sold for approximately $300,000. It had been estimated at eight to 12,000 pounds and went all the way up to many, many, many times that. And beautiful illustrations, not only of the Nawabs and local rulers like the Mughal emperor, but wonderful Sufi tales. So here's what the coronation or investiture of one of the Nawabs would look like. As you can see, he was installed by a British official who was the paramount power. And this brings us to the last part of our talk. You just saw the coronation or investiture of uh, Hyder Khan his predecessor, Ibrahim, was a very cultured man. He also liked women, and one of the women that he liked was a pioneering Muslim director 
uh, actress in silent movies, and they had a child together named Zubeda. And I think that this is an interesting picture for these interesting pictures for several reasons. First of all, you notice the cancellation is in Dumas. Dumas is after Alexander Dumas. One of the families named one of the towns, the beach town in Sachin State, Dumas, after the partially African uh, author. So they were familiar with French literature. Uh, in the 19th century, there were members of families. One was a lawyer. Uh, the father of the previous, of the present Nawab uh, was a, uh, was a, an anesthesiologist. Um, and uh, the present Nawab himself is a lawyer. So this is a very cultured sort of family. He also, one of the members of the family also opted for Pakistan, became prominent in the army of Pakistan. He also married Benazar Bhutto's niece. So this brings us back to the Nawab. And the other thing is his daughter, it's an African uh, Nawab, and his daughter is an actress. And this is an extraordinary picture because she's the villain is in blackface, and she looks like the white woman. She was a tremendous star, Zubeda, and there she is in the title role in, Al in Alamara, the first Indian talkie. So I think what we've showed you is that by starting this, by talking about elite figures, what we've tried to show you is that uh, we shouldn't really relegate all talk about Africans or people of African descent to only talking about slavery or oppression. We need to talk about that and we are gonna talk about that, but we need to talk about their accomplishments and their agency as well. Thank you. Uh, there are a few questions and um, hopefully more will come in. Thank you for that fascinating uh, triptych of a conversation. Um, Ashish Saligram asks, um, I imagine, uh, Pushkar, um, to your presentation, wouldn't a siege here work very easily? Why couldn't the British or the Mughals starve the inhabitants of the fort? Uh, uh, he has a second part of the question. Did the fort ever take cannon, take cannon attacks? And could they fire cannons from the mainland to the island before the 17th, 18th century? So uh, the siege could not work because uh, it was impossible to blockade the fort completely. Uh, you, I mean, though it's surrounded by water on all sides, it's very different kinds of water. Uh, you know, if, if you think of uh, it from, in the, uh, from the perspective of people who live on land, uh, you have to cross water. But if you look at it from the perspective of people who actually live on the sea, like uh, sailors, uh, the obvious problem is it's not really water. It is, uh, it is land. It's, it's this liminal zone, which is part land, part water. Though it's an island, it's connected with the mainland. Um, though it's close to the mainland, it's still off in the water. And it's impossible to have some kind of uh, systematic strategy by which you could completely blockade and siege it. It was tried a number of times. It really did not work. Uh, they always managed to get in supplies somehow. And they had the fresh water too. And of course, the water they had, the fresh water they did have. In terms of uh, cannon before the, I mean, till the 19th century, you do not have the kind of guns that will fire accurately directly into the uh, fort. And in any case, the 19th century is a time which doesn't see a lot of warfare. So there is a book by a, a gentleman called... Uh, Banaji about the Siddhis, where he talks of how in the 19th century, early 19th century, they're an absolute nuisance to the English who are, you know, they go and camp out in Moscow every year. They harass British ships and so on. Of course, by the middle of the 19th century, they've stopped being any kind of uh, nuisance as they've already reached their peace deals with the British. 
And so by the time you have um, the kind of weaponry that's effective against uh, uh, something like the fortress of Janjira, uh, there is no need to use it in any case. But go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that they uh, that they bloody in some of the early encounters they bloody the uh, British as well. Sutano Mukherjee asks, uh, "What was strategic? What is the strategic imperative of Malikambar to develop Zanjira uh, in the middle of nowhere uh, in 17th century? Presumably, Gulf of Cambe was a minor ed, uh, arena in the trade routes." Well, but it, 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 this is halfway between the two important Portuguese ports. And the Portuguese were the uh, most important uh, presence in that area at that time. Also, also this is, uh, um, it's, it's one of the many uh, uh, places that controls uh, shipping because one has to realize that shipping in this era is very rarely across open sea. What you do is coastal hopping. And so it's one of the places that controls the flow of uh, um, people and ships and goods up and down the coast. Because when you come in from, for example, let's say Shiraz, you don't go across the open sea. You actually keep close to the coastline. And this is a location that helps you um, control traffic close to the coastline. Thank you. Vijo Parameshwar uh, asks, most of the people shown as members of the Janjira family don't have typical African features. As compared to that, the Siddhis who live around Junagar and those in North Karnataka have uh, clearly uh, African features. Is this because the latter married one another while the nobility in Janjira had more mixed blood? I think that's true today. In fact, uh, the uh, member of the Sachin family who married into the Budo family, uh, the grandson uh, sons uh, don't look uh, Indian at all. They look uh, completely Caucasian. Uh, and it shows you, you know, I mean, I, I think that the thing that we really have to understand is it's sometimes difficult to tell people when uh, so in the book so we have talked about uh, the paintings of uh, in Bhavnaga, for example, uh, where the wall paintings you can't tell by the color of the people who are the Africans and who are not. So it, it isn't as easy to do as uh, you might think. And uh, it's clear, for example, Zubeda's father was an African, I believe full-blooded, I think, if I remember correctly. But she all of a sudden became a, quote, white woman. And, you know, and there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, about why we don't have more Hindu actresses um, in early movies. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and... Uh, was it one of the questions is where they prefer lighter skinned people? And it's interesting that Zubeda is, is uh, half African. And uh, until uh, Rosie Llewellyn Jones, who's a great historian, a member of the British Empire, and she'll be speaking later uh, talking about this, uh, nobody seemed to realize that Hasmar Mahal's father was an African. But if you look at the paintings in the Ishak Nama, which is in Windsor Castle, which was Wajid Ali Shah's uh, book of love, uh, you'll see that he has three clearly African wives, including Hazrat Mahal, who's clearly African. But look at the stamp that India put out and she doesn't look African at all. Um, Vayu Naidu asks, did Ami, um, Malik Amba's descendants hold uh, the Mughals after Jahangir's death? How can we find out more about Malik Amba's family? Yeah, I, this is one of the uncharted areas. Uh, what happened to these elite figures? Uh, did, did they disappear? Uh, we know that there was constantly going back and forth uh, Fatah Khan and uh, his son, and uh, also Hamid Khan, 
were involved with the moguls. Nobody has really traced these families down through history and seen where they've gone. And some enterprising person is going to do that, I'm sure. Also, we talked about Iklis Khan, which is uh, who was the prime minister of, um, of Bishapur uh, in uh, Ibrahim uh, Adol Shah's reign and his successor's reign. Very powerful man. But we don't know how many other people use the name Iklis Khan. And we didn't have, we had early, in the first book I did, we had chapters on Bishapur. We didn't have in this case because nobody has done the research that needs to be done to, to trace these things in lineage. We're beginning to see some work on that in the Jirja Khan uh, of, uh, and Oluk Khans in Gujarat and Kandish. Nisha PR thanks you and congratulates uh, you on the amazing research. And uh, she asked, do people still live uh, on the island of Janjira? And uh, uh, she can see that people visited from the photographs. Most of these soldiers and rulers of African descent were forgotten and most of their African ethnicity was more or less diluted. Uh, why do you think this was happening? How do you see this? Uh, racialization in the historical context, she asks. So, so nobody stays on the island anymore, but a number of people who used to live on the island now live on the mainland. In fact, the ferrymen who will take you across will often claim descent from the people who lived on the island. Uh, of course, uh, their ethnicity was diluted over time because, uh, I mean, A, they've been naturalized, they've been part of this landscape for a long time. They've also married locally uh, in a lot of instances. But there was always a, a fresh infusion of people from Africa as well, as late as the 19th century when the Nizam of Hyderabad uh, brought in his Abyssinian guard. Uh, yeah, and these, and these people were fluid. They, uh, these, uh, they went from place to place. The uh, people who were brought in the 19th century were first in a Samistan called Wanapathi, which is what we talk about in the book. And they later became the African guard of Hyderabad. So these people were mobile. And the people who, the Hapshi dynasty, which took over Bengal in the 15th century, came from elsewhere to protect the Sultan. And then they just deposed it. Um, I, go ahead. Please go ahead, sir. Um, I, I think that the assumption we have is, you know, people say, well, when did they come? Different groups came at different times. Uh, when I went to the Gear Forest and visited three villages there of Africans, the first person I asked, um, where did your ancestors come from? Said to me, Nigeria, which is in West Africa and uh, claimed that uh, he, his ancestors had been brought there to build the railroads in, uh, in, in Gujarat, which shocked me because I thought that the Indians came to East Africa to build the railroads. Um, so people came from all sorts of different places. We shouldn't assume that they all were the same. Uh, and the most extraordinary of these things was there was an Ethiopian Jew who came, who was captured as a slave and taken to India where he went back and forth between Catholic and Muslim identities and uh, until the Inquisition got him. Well, you only know about him and his Jewish background from Ethiopia because uh, in, from the Inquisition records. Hmm. Um. Viju Barameshwar has another question. Uh, did the navy of the Marathas, the Angres, for example, just bypass Janjira and control most of the coastal Konkan, or did Janjira control much of the seas? They, they all control their own bands. Uh, the Angres controlled areas just north of Janjira. Uh, and they, they also had uneasy agreements and uh, peace between them. Uh, so, uh, not that they were the greatest of friends, but they weren't the greatest of enemies either. They all inhabited the same landscape. Everybody wanted their own uh, uh, pass to be the valid pass for ships to pass through. But uh, 
the Angres, the Siddhis, the Portuguese and the British are the four, well, the English are the four major players on the coast. And uh, all of them have some kind of working relationship. And, and, and the assumption we make is that there was total enmity, but things go back and forth. For example, we found in studying the Jews of Janjira that uh, who were very much military people, we found uh, families that were in both the uh, navies of Janjira and the Angrians. So people, you know, it, it, was, it was not always enmity, or even though there was a lot of enmity. Uh, Rajaram Bhatt sort of uh, is commenting, uh, and it's a callback to an earlier question about uh, uh, features, uh, facial features. Um, he asks if the difference in the features of Siddhis in North Karnataka and uh, people who appeared in this talk uh, is due to Malikambar coming from Abyssinia. Yeah, I mean, I think that we also have to. Um, see that the people didn't always come from the same places. I pulled up the book, we'll be talking about it. And it, we have a chapter about that community and how it's different. And, um, you know, and there was Portuguese uh, who brought in Africans. That's a whole different sort of thing. But what's interesting about the people from uh, Northern Karnataka uh, is that many of them are Pentecostal Christians. And whereas, most of the, uh, the cities that we hear about are Muslims of one sort or another. And there are also Siddhi communities in Pakistan. I mean, they go all the way up the coast. So you'll find them in Makran, you'll find them uh, all the way into Iran. Uh, Bayou Nayu has a question on the fort uh, and asks if it's maintained for heritage purposes and how is it protected and by which regional authorities, if you have an idea. So it's under the Archaeological Survey of India and uh, that is how they managed to prevent people from living inside. But of course, the you know upkeep, preservation and uh, maintenance of any site is expensive. The Archaeological Survey... Uh, uh, does its best, but again, they, they too are stretched and uh, it's a question of also, uh, you know, local communities stepping up and claiming heritage as their own. Uh, I, th I think the whole, whole business of uh, the mission of the Archaeological Survey of India needs to be rethought and uh, people need to be integrated in any kind of vision or plan that they have. And I think there's also material culture as well. And now there's talk uh, about setting up a museum of the princely states in Gujarat. And uh, for my part, I've been collecting material for over 50 years, 60 years. Uh, and um, it seems to me that we need an archive of this kind of material. Uh, and I'm trying to set up one eventually for my collection to go to University of Pennsylvania to include such as princely states, Africans, and uh, Jews in India. Uh, Behroz Shroff, uh, thanks you for, thanks you both for the enlightening talk. Uh, Janjira Fort and the cenotaphs uh, need restoration, he says. Yet the ASI seems to have overlooked this area as they have neglected the Siddhi Said Mosque and the Sarkhej Rosa in Ahmedabad. Can this restoration issue be addressed by scholars? The, the short answer is hopefully. Uh, but again, I mean, uh, I, I think there needs to be mounting pressure from uh, local communities more than uh, either... Uh, you know, politicians deciding, uh, the ASI deciding, or scholars coming in with recommendations. I think uh, local awareness and local pressure is usually the best way to go, but we, we all certainly hope for a change in the scenario. Behrouz was one of the editors of this volume, and she has played a tremendous role in, uh, in helping the cities of, uh, of Gujarat. And I would highly recommend her video, uh, 
cities of Gujarat maintaining traditions and building community. I think it's a great starting point uh, for uh, dealing with this issue. Um, I think uh, we're out of questions at the moment. Uh, are there any additional comments that either of you would like to make? Pushkar and Kenneth. Um, I would just like to uh, tell you again that we have the three volumes. This is the one, African Diaspora and Communities Across South Asia, um, Black Ambassadors of, of uh, Politics, Religion, and Music in India, and uh, African Rulers and Generals in India. Across the world, digital copies are available at Amazon, uh, hard copies are available at Amazon, except in India, and we're trying to get them on Pothy. We've had some trouble uh, getting their exact specifications and it's been delayed. Oh, actually that, that, those volumes are on, it's another set of volumes. In the past uh, two years, we've completed two three volume sets, one on the Maharajas of Gujarat, which is the one that uh, is not yet up on Pothy, uh, and the one on Africans. And now we're working on the states of Maharashtra and also uh, Muslims and Jews in India. Thank you. Thank you uh, so very much for this absolutely fascinating, enlightening, extraordinary kickoff to uh, a series that we've been uh, looking forward to for quite a while. Uh, since uh, you brought it to us, uh, Kenneth, and uh, it's 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 just been it's been eye opening, and I think I think uh, for, for a layperson like me, uh, it, it will take a little bit of processing. Also, uh, we're looking forward to the next uh, um, session, which is uh, on next Thursday, uh, and the, at the same. Uh, uh, Zoom address of uh, Bangalore International Center. And uh, thank you so much, Pushkar, for uh, the fascinating uh, presentation and to, to bringing us to this world of Danjira, which is which sounds a lot like uh, a, a 70s uh, uh, Hindi film, villain den <laughs> with crocodiles, uh, but no less, no less than, no less romantic uh, than any film, I suppose. Thank you, Kenneth, and of course, thank you to Dr. Ali, who has, uh, who is always uh, a fascinating uh, person to listen to. Uh, all I have to say now is uh, thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you, audiences, for being so engaged, and you. Uh, see you all next Thursday. Thank you, Laika, and thank you, Ravi, and thank you, PIC. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.